Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And especially thank you, uh, Omar, for inviting me to this talk and Yvonne for organizing everything so nicely. It's a very nice city and the culture is amazing. And also we had, I think, very good discussions about corporations here already, so very nice. Uh, and uh, now I would like to spend, well, I was planning for one hour. Uh, I have to see, I have al as always, I've put too many slides in. And uh, uh, the translator said, I have to make it very slow. So this is somehow a problem. So anyhow, I try to uh, tell you something about aerosol and health um, and an approach we are doing. And of course, uh, I am not anymore so often in the laboratory. So there are many other people here uh, I need to, to name. So students and um, cooperators from different places. And we are also working uh, for now for six years for uh, cooperation uh, with several institutes, which I'm heading uh, to uh, um, work on the air pollution causes. And I will show something on this as well. First, uh, as you heard from Omar, I'm placed in Munich and Rostock, and you could see it's not very close. So this is whole Germany, which is covered by that difference, uh, the distance. And um, this, we have now two units from Munich and Rostock forming a joint mass spectrometry center, and that's our organization. Um, some words about about Rostock. Rostock is an uh, pretty old uh, university, uh, founded in 1419, so 100 years before Cortes came to here, we were already studying uh, different things in, in Rostock. Uh, and Helmholtz Centrum München is one, of, uh, is one of the large centers we have, research centers we have. So I learned uh, just before that you also have uh, centers here, research centers. We have several, like Max Planck and Helmholtz. Helmholtz is a bit more applied, like for health research, space. Yesterday we heard Alfred Wegner Institute, uh, which is also Helmholtz Association. And we are work in Helmholtz Centrum Munich uh, for environmental health. So it's more or less a bridge. And here are some of the work fields, and I will, uh, will uh, uh, talk a little bit about, in the beginning, about mass spectrometry and analysis in the second half, then on aerosol and health research. So uh, that's the, uh, the outline. I will start with aerosol and health um, and give a short introduction. As I've learned, that the group here is very much interdisciplinary, which is great, because we have to work together to tackle these problems in atmospheric science. Uh, but of course, everybody is then need to give always an introduction what he is working on. And I, I do something about aerosol and health first. Um, so uh, we all know that we have emissions, natural sources, anthropogenic sources, and we have secondary formation of compounds and aging of aerosols. You know it very well here in Mexico because you're high up, you have much sun, you have ozone, you have much emissions. That's why it's a very big problem here in Mexico. And this uh, then, of course, has influences on mankind in two fields, in climate and health. We have heard already yesterday, for example, like the polar regions are influenced, so the climate influence is of course severe, but the chemistry of uh, the atmosphere has changed a lot, and uh, with that we get compounds and emissions which are transferred to us, and we have increased morbidity and mortality in places where we are exposed to air pollution. So that's a really a big issue. Millions of people are dying too early because of air pollution. And if we now look to the things which are flying around, you can see here a sketch, you can see it's a size scale here, and we have molecules, very small uh, um, entities which could be dangerous here, ozone, but NOx is a big topic in Germany now, but here it's maybe ozone. Then we have droplet and small aerosols, we have combustion aerosols, aggregates, we have we have mineralic compounds like quartz crystals or asbestos fibers, which have a specific toxicity. Yeah? And we have also biological things like endotoxin and allergens, smaller fragments of biological um, uh, um, um, entities. But then we have also things which are, which are directly dangerous because they, they in could infect you, like a virus or, um, 
or a bacteria or uh, um, some mold spores on pollen also are important of allergy. So we have different mechanisms which are all interrelated in the end to form uh, or to, to, to give this um, effects, these health effects we are facing. And if we now look at such particles, they are very different in shape and appearance, you know, the sea salt crystal, the soot particle, ammonium nitride, secondary aerosol, some smeltering, some biological particles. So what is flying around is an interesting microcosmos, but it's even more interesting if you look into the chemistry, because there are hundreds of thousands of compounds on there, which we have to more or less um, face with. And all these health effect studies get more or less a kickoff. And the kickoff, it, it was known before that health uh, effects occur, but it, there was a kickoff in this London smog uh, episode in um, 1952. At that time, still people were using coal for heating. And there was an inversion situation, and it was a terrible time. It was really uh, dark uh, during the day, out of air pollution. Maybe sometimes like it is now in China. And you could see it was very bad, because they even cancelled a soccer game in England. You could imagine that. It means it must be really bad. <laughs> but the really bad uh, sulfur dioxide and smoke was going up, and the death rate was increasing. And it kept high for a longer time. It was going up, and the death rate was increasing. And it kept high for a longer time. It took longer time to get bad. And from that, the people really know, wow, people are dying from air pollution. And uh, the reason I mentioned before, in inversion layer, so London was sitting in his own dirt, more or less, for several days. Everything was accumulated, uh, and people were breathing all this, uh, this high concentration. You could see here, it was going up to 2,000 microgram of PM, which is, well, you know, 1,000 now in Beijing, you have several times a year, yeah? but uh, 2,000, I think, even for Beijing is not possible. And this inversion, uh, more or less, is, is a reason for the high, uh, for the high um, um, concentrations, as well as the many sources which are there. Oops, that was too fast. So, and then a huge amount of studies followed, and I would only take out one, Again, a landmark study, uh, as the Harvard Six City Studies from Dockery and co-workers. And they found out if they look to different places in the US with people which have un otherwise similar living conditions, you could take the average PM concentration there and relate it to the risk to die earlier of a disease. And this was the first proof epidemiologically that there is this connection. And nowadays, I think there are hundreds of studies showing that indeed uh, air pollution is killing. Uh, it was reanalyzed, and it's now, uh, but it was one of the of the first very uh, impactful studies. Well, why is it so? If we inhale particle, and we have a particle size distribution here, uh, we have uh, larger particles, which are to a large extent are are. Uh, um, deposited in the upper airways, maybe up to the first, uh, first bronchitis. But then we have, we have more or less bronchial deposition of, uh, of the smaller fractions, and the very small particles, actually they are going quite deep into the lung. And this is, um, of course, not so nice, because you have chemicals which are transported then in a very vulnerable region. Why is that region so vulnerable? Okay, let me go here, yeah. So why? Well, because you are in close contact there to, uh, to uh, the direct, this, in close contact with the cells themselves. So this one mechanism is oxidative stress, which is a first step to be believed for inflammation, and you have then many, many uh, alterations, uh, which is worse than diseases like COPD or inducing diseases like COPD, fibrosis, and asthma, on the other hand, we have compounds which are gene toxic in there, like PIHs, and you have then, um, uh, you have then uh, DNA damage, which can lead on long term to cancer. And if we now look into the lung, we see that we have a sponge-like structure of the lung, 
And uh, in this sponge, in the network here, you can see you have a very thin membrane between, between um, or membrane between the airspace and the bloodway. And you only have one or two cell layers between that. And these cells, if they get a particle, of course, they can obtain a very high local dose. Uh, and you can see it's a high surface, but you know, we have, we have an, a huge amount of ventilation of that, and, uh, and, it's, and particles can come into here, they can come direct into contact with cells, for example, macrophages, which are crawling inside of the alveoli to clean it, because we don't have other mechanisms there in the deep lung. So these macrophages then directly interact with the particles, for example, or small particles can enter into the bloodstream. So we have many mechanisms how now these particles can, uh, can uh, release their bad potential for us. Well, some mechanisms are quite well understood, like for fibers, if you have asbestos. It's very well known, here you can see a macrophage, and this poor guy is much uh, 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 smaller than this asbestos fiber, and he tried to clean it, he tried to digest it, so, but it, it, it cannot do it. It's a frustrated phagocytosis, which is open up the cell, the cell is then releasing the interior, and this gives an alarm signal, so it gives an inflammation signal. So it is very easy for this type of particles. We know fibers which are long and persistence are dangerous for that reason. But if we look uh, to other particles, it's a very complex process. There are many hypotheses, and we are all researching still on that to better understand it. Well, if you have a cell, there are, this is an, uh, a view graph showing the inflammation pathway, and when you have, uh, when you have uh, um, particles, they can be engulfed. So the cell is taking up the particles, and then when this, uh, when this lysosome is rupturing, the in internal uh, um, 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 digestion enzymes and the particles are coming into the cell. And this is triggering a cascade, which in the end forms the activation of the inflammatory system via, via uh, interleukin um, uh, 1, alpha, and beta formation. So it's more or less uh, the structure. And you have, of course, several pathways. The PM can be engulfed and go in, but it also can bind to receptors. Or when the macrophage is dying of particles, like the poor guy we have seen before, we can, we can get pathogen and danger signals which are attached to the cells and alarm the cells, something is happening, and inflammation uh, is started. So inflammation, uh, uh, here's again, uh, it's a bit more this, uh, highlighted this pathway here. So we have the particles, the receptor uh, signaling the rupture of the lysosomes, and then we get to this, uh, from the pro-inflammatory markers, we get the inflammatory markers, which attract uh, more uh, macrophages, for example, other cells, and bring the body to an inflammatory state, but there is no uh, pathogen there. So it's a sterile infection. And the Kronos infection, the permanent infection induced by air pollution, is believed to be uh, responsible for these health effects. And if we now uh, translate the particle matter we have in, in Europe, Sorry, I'm a bit focused on Europe. Uh, my funding is coming from there. <laughs> uh, and uh, they, you can see in different parts of Europe, depending on the particulate uh, concentration, you have a different reduction of life expectancy. So we work with Finland. We discussed this before. This is pretty good, yeah, about nothing. Yeah? But uh, I'm coming from Cologne, which is here. And so we have more than one year reduction in average just by air pollution. You know, it's a valley, not as bad as here in this respect, but it's a valley and the air is trapped a little bit. You could see the Po Valley here. You could see some Eastern European high spots as well here. Uh, and uh, so there are, of course, many questions to solve now why these are toxic and we have to understand the chemistry and the biology better in order to get uh, this problem solved. So again, uh, this was London, but nowadays, you know, we have it also in Europe, in Beijing, and of course also here in Mexico. Okay, first I will, so as Omar invited me, and we are working also in the field of, of analysis of aerosols, I will uh, give uh, two, an overview of two techniques to characterize aerosols. 
And then I will come to this approach we are using for, for uh, addressing health effects or biological effects. Well, if we look to the organic composition of aerosols, we can see that there's a huge amount of compounds in these aerosols which could be markers of sources. We have inorganic markers, but we also have organic markers, like mm. specific PIHs or whole paints and stearanes. Levo uh, glucosan is a sugar, uh, is a anhydro sugar coming from wood combustion, also wood combustion marker here, the dehydroadiabatic acid, cholesterol from cooking, and we also have oxidized species showing that the atmosphere more or less uh, is going into a soa formation when we have high ozone. The question is how we can measure these compounds efficiently day by day. And um, there are some approaches. Omar is doing here a nice job with his uh, um, system. He is waiting for a bit more funding for a better instrument, but he will get it, I'm sure. Um, but uh, one possibility to do it is uh, to collect aerosols on a filter. And the idea here was to make it quick. So we said, OK, we would try to analyze it without, desorb uh, without uh, desorption, just on the filter. And for that, uh, uh, there is an internal standard, uh, so C13 or deuterium-labeled compounds put on the filter sample, uh, or on the stripe, we take a stripe of the filter, and then it's wetted with liquid derivatization reagent. And the filter itself, the compounds on the sil uh, filter are, are um, derivatized. Why? Because the polar compounds uh, 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 they need, like here, uh, like in, in alcohol, they need to be silylated to be better separable in the GCMS mass spectrometer. So we derivatize the polar compounds to get them into, uh, uh, into the mass spectrometer, and the trick then is we thermally dissolve now the, the already derivatized compounds, but there's still some components there which are not derivatized. That's why we are constantly uh, are giving MSDFA in the gas phase during desorption over this uh, filter piece. So we desorb, thermally desorb the filter, and then we give uh, this compound over it, and we can do GCMS. And the nice thing now is, if we look at one GCMS run, only different mass traces, we can now see the PIHs, so oxidized PIHs, the sugars, acids, phenols, and alkanes, so polar and unpolar compounds on the same time. And this, of course, is very, very important, as you can get much more markers uh, of, uh, of aerosol composition with this approach. And why is it so? We still actually have to say the old technique without derivatization, but still some compounds can be seen. This is now a one and a half year daily measurement series, and you can see that the concentration of different compounds is very much varying. And it's of course imp important to understand the health effects, how the composition is changing day by day. So we have this typical, let's say, summer winter. Um, uh, type of, uh, uh, of um, variation, but we also have day-by-day -day variation coming from uh, sources and different, uh, different emission profiles. So what we can do now, we can do an analysis, it is called PMF, positive matrix factorization, and we can try to analyze which compounds are well behaving similar. And then we get a source profile and from, from the composition, we can say, well, this is rather gasoline, cars, or wood combustion, or that. So here you can see factors and the contribution of different compounds, just you know, some selected, of different compounds to the factor. So we have factor, uh, the blue factor, for example, and we can see here, oh, yeah, many of the alkanes are in there, and so on. So it's just different factors. And later on, we can look which factor actually represents a specific source. And this is now done here. Now we look at the factors, and we can look by the chemicals. We see, oh, here are PIHs, you know, and the wood combustion markers. This is wood combustion. And we can see wood combustion comes in winter only, of course. We don't burn wood so much in summer in Germany. Uh, and the car emissions, lubricate and oil, uh, is coming all the time because we drive all the time, car. 
Coal combustion, again, this is, was a surprise for us. This is also residential coal burning still happening in Germany. Not much, but we can see the factor. The biogenic emissions, uh, okay, they're coming in summer, of course. And car emission and heating oil emissions, we have here, interestingly, we have, um, uh, we have the winter domination, and this comes because here we have diesel cars and heating oil, and we use a lot of heating, oil heating in Germany. This is how you can look day by day on the source profile. Why, uh, why is it sensible? For example, we can now look how sources are changing over time. In Germany, we use this type of low emission zone, like you do here. You, know, you forbid some cars to drive on some days. So we had this type of uh, plaquettes for the car, and green is the newest. You can drive in. If you have a red or a yellow plaquette, well, stay out. Yeah? So uh, the inner city now is free of the old cars. So when we measured the uh, traffic factor, we could see it was a factor uh, over some time before uh, the, uh, the um, low emission zone. And after that, it's indeed reduced, which is foreseeable. Interesting point, the wood combustion factor increased because we have a program for renewable energy. And now we have more pellet burning and wood because they are subsidized. So not good for air pollution, uh, but you know it's happening. So we are, we, you can see, you can very easily see effects of your measures by looking at the indicator distribution. Another aspect of the indicator is, of course, if you look at aging processes. There's now an aging experiment in a chamber. Uh, chamber of the Paul Scherer Institute, we did the organics there, and you put the aerosols in and light and ozone in, and you can see, oh, uh, the PIH is decreasing over time, wall loss corrected, because they are oxidized. In the same time, you can see that the oxidized PIHs are going up and peaking, some other are staying constant, and other are going up as well. You can see the chemistry, and this you can then follow by the oxidized species. Uh, and it's also important to know whether this oxidized atmosphere might be more dangerous than the emission itself. And this was, uh, we contributed to that work here in the Palgera Institute, looking uh, at SOA. I think it's not so, so um, super surprising, but you know, it was a good journal. Of course, SOA is very important in China, and we have shown it here, uh, is this uh, data, and we, we put the data on the GCMS as well, and could prove it, that the SOA markers are in there. Okay, um, just second example. Of course, this is an offline technique. You have to sample and bring it to lab and do it. It would be also nice to have the possibility to online measure at least some compounds which are very interesting, and for us the PIHs are very interesting, because they are known to cause health effects. And the question is, can we do a single particle measurement of PIHs? Uh, and um, this I will show you now. Um, aerosol mass spectrometry, I'm not sure if you are aware of, but there are two main techniques. Uh, single particle laser mass spectrometry has been around from uh, Hinz and Spengler, and uh, I think even a bit earlier from Spengler, by the way, and Prasser. They developed this approach, which was actually firstly um, um, done in the US, but not with time-of-flight mass spectrometry. Anyhow, single particle detection uh, is here possible, and it's very nice, but it has some drawbacks. On the other hand, there's a method with thermal desorption electron impact ionization mass spectrometry, which is very, uh, very broadly used now. I think there are about 1,000 instruments available worldwide. If we do a campaign now, we get three or four groups asking if they can come with their AMS. And now we have already two. We don't need another one. Thank you. So it's just you know, st state of the art now in, in, in aerosol uh, mass spectrometry. This has been a bit uh, well abundant for a time, so low development. But I think the potential on the long run is very high, my personal feeling. Why? Because we can look at single particle. And if we have now particles and look at PIHs, there is two possibilities. We can have some hot particles, some pure PIH-containing particles, or we can have an even distribution of many particles having always a little bit of PIHs. For health effects, this makes all the difference. If you have one particle coming on one spot with all the toxic compounds, it's much more worse than being dispersed. 
And this you only can measure by single particle measurement. Otherwise, you have, if you take a filter, you have no chunks. Uh, and this is the classical time of light mass spectral approach for particles, eta of ms. So you have particles into a vacuum, then they, uh, it's, it's a particle beam formed, you have scattering of light, and the scattering of light uh, with, two, with two scatterings, you can see the velocity of the particle. Yeah? And then you know when it will be in the ion source, and you know the size, because the velocity depends upon the expansion on the size, aerodynamic size. And when it comes into here, you know, you, you measure it here, or you say size, and it will come in 30 microseconds, it will come in the center. Then you fire a laser, and you get a mass spectrum. This is our system, it's a home-built system, by the way. Uh, so two time of light tubes, several lasers, and so on. Um, um, pretty much standard. Um, and what you can do with it, you know, you can, the particle is coming in size, the first sizing, second sizing, and then you hit with a strong laser, you ablate it, and you get then, you know, a plasma, and you get ions like carbon ion, carbon clusters, you know, sulfate ions, uh, and uh, some nitrogen-containing ions, and so on, uh, uh, nitrate. And if you do that for several particles, this is a good a very good um, 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 result from Rob Healy. He is now working with uh, Environment Canada, by the way. A very good result you can quantify also, like with AMS. If you do it for a long time and put all this together, you can make this pie chart as well. Uh, and was not for a long time not really used, but now Rob Healy has shown that. A very nice work, uh, I have to say. But we see inorganics. Organic compounds in the plasma are, are, are digested, are going down. We have shown um, um, a mobile system uh, some years ago where we can look at the pHs. For that, we are, when the particle is sized, we are firing an infrared laser, desorb the aromatic species of that very particles, and then do a two-photon ionization of these pHs. What we get is a single particle pH spectrum which is very nice, but the problem is we are losing now the information on the inorganic compounds. Now we have only pHs, very nice, and we are working on that. Uh, like here, you can see now a classical LDI approach, wood combustion, you have mainly potassium in there. It's a marker for wood combustion. Yeah? And uh, if you now look for the pH particles, we can see the distribution of, of the pHs on such a particle. Uh, and uh, which is which is quite uh, quite nice. So, for example, if you now look here for different wood types, a beech wood particle, a spruce wood particle, you find here in soft wood particles you have always retin, is a very important marker for soft wood. In hard wood particle, soot particle from wood combustion, you have only uh, um, the normal pHs. You don't have these uh, typical resin compounds in there. You can even distinguish the type of wood. Uh, and now you can measure, do measurements outside, and you see, well, in winter we have much more particles which are softwood or, uh, coming from pHs because we have, in winter, we use more pH. Very simple. Now, uh, just two slides, and I will move that field. We were thinking we need both. We need the inorganic uh, information and the organic from the same particle, and uh, this we have now solved in a quietly um, difficult way. So when uh, we have our, uh, um, um, our particle coming in, we first do laser desorption, uh, and then uh, we do, we do uh, uh, the photoionization for the pHs, but the particle is still there. Yeah? The core is still there because we very, very softly desorbed and ionized the, the organics. Then, what we do then, within one microsecond, we switch the polarity of our mass spectrometer. Then we shoot again with a third laser, which is now doing LDI, and then the ions are going in the other way. So we could now make from the same single particle inorganic profile as well as organic profile. You can see here, for example, a diesel particle, you have carbon clusters, you have sodium and iron, uh, which is dominant, and you have the pH structure. And from the wood combustion, you have, again, potassium as marker, and you have retin as marker in the organic phase and the pHs. And it's from the same particle. So you have both. You have now both information, which is 
rather new technique, so it was just uh, published um, a month ago. And if we now look uh, to, to ambient, we, in Rostock it's very clean air. And when coming from the seaside, we mainly see these particles, sea salt, yeah? nothing in. But sometimes we get those particles as well. And this is maybe when somebody is doing his garden work, you know, and burn it, then we have here potassium and we have all the markers of the wood combustion. So it's, uh, and I think it would be also very nice to look with this technique here in, in Mexico City at the PIHs, you know, to see single particle pH distribution. With this, I will lose, uh, I, I, I will go away from, that, from the measurement technique and come to the more biological part, yeah, just in time. Um, and uh, we'll tell you how we did in the last, or how we built up in our consortium in the last time um, uh, this uh, work on aerosol and health effects. So we are using mainly lung cells with partners, also animals, which is much more difficult for us in Europe. And you have here very nice facilities I've seen today and very nice possibilities also, which would really um, to my opinion, uh, would foster and, and, and make sense of a cooperation in here. Okay, so uh, we, um, six years ago, I was able to get a grant, a very nice grant from Helmholtz, where I could pick partners for, for health research. So I get funding and I could invite people to join me to more or less work for us. Very nice, uh, but of course we are close cooperation partners here. Uh, and uh, uh, um, uh, we used that money for the approach I will show you in the following. So the idea was now, as it's so complex and the composition changes every day, to make, to start a bit easier, first look at different sources and try to understand how different sources act. And then you can continue and make mixtures and age and so on to better understand it. So we have aerosol sources and you would like to simultaneously do cell exposure. On the other hand, um, chemical characterization with all what we can do. And then uh, we, we look at the biological uh, response on multi-omics and tox level and also the chemical response and try to bring it together. That's the idea. Mm -hmm. yeah? So. Up to now, we looked at three sources. I will mainly concentrate here on the shipping emissions. They are quite important and not yet, let's say, uh, not deal so much with. Uh, people thought ships are far away, but it's not true. They are very often in the harbor and close, close the coastline. What we're using and we are developing together with VitroCell was then an, uh, uh, let's say, online exposure station, which we can bring to different places to look at the places where we have engines or facilities or aging chambers to look at the emissions. And we also built this mobile, mobile um, S2 bio lab, so we could put these things here in the lab, move it to a place, and then we can do measurements. Inside, we have an, uh, uh, the aerosol is coming in here, PM2.5 separated, and then it's moisturized, and we can uh, subject it now on the cells. Uh, which are growing here on this purple membrane as a monolayer and simulating somehow the exposure in the lung. That's the idea, um, air-liquid phase uh, in, um, exposure. And then, of course, for response, we are looking at the cells, we're harvesting the cells, and we look on the multi-omics uh, level be beside normal cytotox. We look at transcriptome, proteome, uh, and metabolome, if there are any changes um, due to the respective emission. So how does it work? So uh, mostly we label our cells. So we have the cells, uh, we have uh, uh, one cell culture we have labeled with heavy lysine. So all the cells are heavy and the others are light. And now we, c we do the exposure, for example, aerosol uh, and clean air or aerosol and filtered aerosol, whatever you want. And in the end, we can mix the two, uh, two cell types. And if we do then the proteomics, we can see always light and heavy masses. So we could directly quantify the differences if proteins are formed, more formed or less formed. 
The same we can do for, for uh, metabolomics and the flux approach. There we are using 13.3 labeled glucose, or uh, in transcriptomics we cannot use uh, labeling because we have the array technology we are using for transcriptomics. And of course, when we go for a measurement, it's a bit of effort. We have to bring our mobile lab, you know, it moves then to a measurement site, like here in the, in the engine building of Rostock University. And you can see when we do experiments, it's rather busy in there. You can see here when the people are harvesting the cells, for example. So this container is really, you know, we have, there are two more people in there you don't see here. So it's really um, high noon, always when exposure is over uh, and the cells are harvested. So uh, the first study we did was, was shipping. Why shipping? If you look at ship emissions, you can see that the globally the PM10 and NOx emissions of ships and road traffic are about the same. So it's really an important source. You can say when it's in the middle of the ocean, let the climate people think about it, you know, uh, the Arctic haze researchers, but for health effects, you know, who cares? But, 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 but the ships are coming also close to land, and then we have a big issue. And this has been addressed, oh, first this, you can see here, it's cloud formation, it's ship tracks. Cloud formation because the ship emissions are also nuclei for cloud formation. So you just, if you would like to have, to follow the ships, you just have to follow the cloud, and in the beginning of the cloud you have a ship. Um, well, uh, uh, there's a nice study of Corbett, and he was estimating the health effects uh, which came additionally by, uh, by these emissions of ships. And you can see, of course, you know, it's not in the middle of Africa, not in Siberia. It's along the coastlines. Yeah? And Europe, we have quite an issue because the channel uh, in, uh, in the North Sea as well um, um, as the Kadetrine in the Baltic Sea are one of the most frequented uh, shipping lines. All the ships are going to Russia, to Scandinavia, Litavia, and so on. Poland, Germany are going the same way here. And of course, you know, very big uh, uh, Asia, India, and also uh, US is quite influenced. And more uh, 60,000 excess deaths has been calculated, you know, um, I will not say it was 60,001 or 60,002, but is you know is an estimation. But it shows that there is really an impact of this uh, this, this uh, um, type of air pollution. Now the experiment looks like this. Uh, we have different fuels. We have a research engine, a land-based research ship engine, which can do now a profile. We dilute the aerosol, factor of 100, factor of 40 or so then subject it to our cell culture, as I've shown before. In the same time, we do all the chemical things. We collect, we collect uh, particles to GCMS, FDI, CR, GC by GC, whatever we can do, but also do online measurements. Uh, so you can see here the engine and the people working here, you know, control room of the engine, online uh, mass spectrometry, photonization monitoring, particle size monitoring, and so on. And we have a test cycle. If you know a car test cycle, it's a very slow test cycle for a ship because it's mainly running the same speed. It's a normal speed. They don't do full, full speed because of costs. So normally 60, 70%. And then they have maneuvering. And then they have, this is a typical profile for a ferry. Ferry going between Rostock and Gatesur, you know, driving for some time, maneuvering, uh, idling, cars on, going back. Uh, and if we now look at the particle size distribution, here measured by different uh, instruments and combined, we could see always now in red are the heavy fuel oil um, um, emissions and blue the diesel fuel uh, oil emissions. You could see that the, here is now the number uh, uh, concentration and the mass integral. You could see that we have much higher concentration of small particles for the heavy fuel oil, while the normal diesel engine makes larger particles, yeah? which have also quite a bit of mass, of course, but less small particles. And this was, in the beginning, strange for us, but we understood it very well. The engineers know that. They said, well, uh, a diesel engine with diesel is more smoking than with heavy fuel oil. And the reason for that is you have, in heavy fuel oil, you have metals in and sulfur. 
And this is hindering uh, the suit formation or destruction of the suit. When it's hot, it's oxidized. So you get small particles which are very much inorganic and organic, but not so much elemental carbon. Uh, so we have here uh, smaller particles, and in, 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 the, uh, in the diesel fuel, we find these typical agglomerates. So uh, very loosely bound particles, lots of carbon in there. So uh, just to keep in mind, so we subjected now those gases and aerosols or particles to our cells, and the deposition uh, dose uh, we get in the end was 50 or uh, 60 nanograms per square centimeter uh, for heavy fuel oil, and about half for diesel fuel. And we couldn't steer it because we don't know the mass before. We only in the end could make the, to the exact dose measurement. So note, we had a higher dose for heavy fuel oil. Uh, small particles in a higher concentration. And then uh, we go into the organic characterization. I will not talk much about it. This is comprehensive 2DGC-MS. Um, if you want to uh, know more about it, it's a very nice technique to resolve hundreds or thousands of compounds. If you want to know more about this, please refer to Omar. He do it here. He has a possibility. Uh, the only thing I would like to tell, if you have a mass spec, you can very easily classify the compounds and you can uh, assign each peak to a compound class. This is diesel fuel, heavy, heavy fuel oil. You can see it's just more color here, more bubbles, which means you have more different compounds and more concentration of that. Yeah? So it's, and then you can go into it and look which compound it is specifically, but this is just an overview of few graphs. The other thing we did, is FTICR, so high resolution mass spectrometry. So we looked at, you know, as a number of uh, polar compounds in there uh, with electrospray ionization and uh, atmospheric chemical ionization. You could see in the polar region, for example, we have much more in the Venn diagram, we see much more signals from uh, heavy fuel oil. There are much more compounds, different compound species in there, just a number. Yeah, and the same is shown here uh, um, um, in the um, HCOC plot. I will not uh, go into that for time reasons. Take home message, uh, the uh, organic composition of the heavy fuel oil is much more complicated and there's much more organic in there. Yeah? Less soot, but much more organic compounds. We also can, oops, it's very fast. So we can also can do it with online method. This is an online, uh, the same technique we used for a single particle measurement. We can also use for gas phase measurement. It's, it's a photoionization approach, actually by our spin-off. Uh, so spin our spin-off, it's four of my former students doing building instruments for scientists, more or less. And you can see here, diesel fuel, this is a mass spectrum. We only measure aromatic compounds in the gas phase now, and when we switch to heavy fuel oil, you can see suddenly you have much more of the organic compounds. And well, it's not so interesting because the profile is very slow. Yeah? It's very much more interesting if you measure this for a ch quickly changing thing, but it shows you online very nicely what is happening here in, uh, in the gas phase. If we now, is now a summary plot in the paper, it's all the tables are given of hundreds of compounds, but if you summarize it, you can see it's a differential plot here. You can see on everything on this side is more enhanced in heavy fuel oil on log scale emissions, and everything here in diesel fuel. And you can see also it's more diluted. Everything is more concentrated in the heavy fuel oil emission, except of elemental carbon and black carbon. That's what you see. So you have just more soot-like emissions from diesel fuel, a more organic and inorganic uh, composition in the uh, heavy fuel oil. Um, and uh, so this was, for us, we were thought, okay, this, and we want to use the heavy fuel oil emission as standard for a bad sink, because we have PIHs in, we have metals, zinc, vanadium, everything we don't want to have was in high concentration, in the diesel fuel, uh, in the heavy fuel oil emissions. Uh, a summary of that again here given, uh, and now we look to the biology, and this is a bit difficult to understand, the biological people know that graphs. 
It's a, just a very simple fold change. So we did uh, replicates of the measurement, uh, which give us a significance. So when a protein or a, or a transcript change in the same direction, it's very significant, it's high up. If it's scattering, it's down. So all the values below the line you cannot use because it's just scattering. Yeah? Replicates are very important in that case. Everything above that, you have a significant regulation. Uh, and this is only giving, of course, just you know, the regulation, no information on the, on, the, on the species. But what we see as a regulation, which means it's a log scale, so this is a factor of 2, factor of uh, 4, factor of 8, log 2, fold change. What we have saw, uh, seen here is that uh, for the diesel fuel, we get a broader regulation. So somehow the biological system was reacting stronger on the system, which does not mean it's more toxic, but it reacts stronger. Yeah? Um, and we have seen that, interestingly, on, on, on all three levels, so metabolome, proteome, and transcriptome. Um, uh, we see that the diesel fuel somehow induces uh, more, um, more, let's say, um, yeah, regulation. Uh, so more activity. And also, it was surprising for us, because normally you would say if something is not toxic, it would not react so much. If it's getting more toxic, it would, it would react. But of course, you have to look closer into it. And if you go now, regulation is a very simple method, then you have, of course, go into specific markers. Yeah, you can see now, this is now a, a, a transcriptomic uh, um, um, a markers. You can uh, take some out here. You can, you can look at, uh, uh, at some of the markers and you can see, well, for the heavy fuel oil, we have many inflammation markers, ox stress markers. We have also some of the normal pathways. We have stronger activation indeed for the heavy fuel oil. You could see this here in the summary of the, of, uh, of the effect of the pathways. But we have other pathways which are very deep underlying biological processes which have been strongly affected in the diesel fuel. This was an interesting result, so we also tried to integrate the data of multi-omics, but this is very difficult, actually, because you, know, you have different time scales for proteins, uh, and, or transcripts, proteins, and uh, metabolites. Anyhow, um, um, uh, this, uh, the different adverse pathways are activated just by changing the fuel, uh, and largely different uh, was a surprising result and was published. To look now closer into it, if you take macrophage cell model, you have a cell which is more vulnerable to particles because they take up the particles on purpose. And we see the same effect here on the protein level, for example, so more regulation for the blue dots, so meaning that the biological activity is stronger. But if we now look on the LDH, we now see that uh, toxicity is occurring, and it's even larger now for the diesel fuel. So that shows that really toxic effects, or cytotox effects for isolated raw macrophages, that's a marine macrophage, is higher here. Okay, um, so this indeed, I think, proves quite nicely that, that, that this, this overall regulation seems also to have something to do with actually toxicity, because the cells are dying there. Our take-home message is, you know, if you would like to clean up ships, don't play with, f with fuel or sim just, you know, filter it out. So it's, it's not enough just to say, oh, we have a better fuel. You don't know what happened, and it's not very much straightforward. So very briefly, in overview, we did the same now with wood combustion, uh, very same concept, different, different uh, uh, ovens have been compared, and uh, now lockwood and softwood. Um, uh, just, you know, it's heavy done in Finland. Uh, they have a nice facility for aging. Uh, you can see here the people working, and here in, it's always dark in Finland, huh? in winter, <laughs> cold and dark. It's nice to have a nice wood fire then, you know, to, to keep warm. Um, and, of course, if you compare now to diesel emissions, yeah, they are very stable. Wood emissions are very unstable because you have to reload the oven all the time while the pellet burner is extremely stable because it's burning like, like an oil heating. Yeah? So we looked at chemicals. I will not go too much into too much details. 
important point here is that the Lockwood burner, uh, we had the highest dose, even compared to diesel fuel before we had 28 nanograms per square centimeter, it was even high dose. And if we look to the chemicals, we had the highest concentration again for PR ages, for formaldehyde, yeah, for benzene, for toxicants, we had the highest dose uh, for wood combustion aerosol, so it seems to be even worse in the, what you think on the chemical compounds than uh, ship diesel emissions. If we now, I'll make it quick now, if we now look at the regulation, which we have seen is somehow a good marker, we see this was our diesel fuel, wood combustion is much lower, uh, much lower activity compared to diesel, and the pellet even, well, maybe it's close to significant, but the pellet was similar or even at least a bit more regulated. Strange, because the pellet now was totally clean. Yeah? And we, you can now again go here, you see a sub 1A1 uh, PIA activation again. You have for be beach a very high value, yeah? because you have high concentrations there, not for pellet, uh, and so on. Uh, but the question is now, why wood combustion is so less active? And there's a theory around and we discussed this already about antioxidants. And when you have wood combustion, and if you look at the phenol concentration, you have here pellet uh, and diesel fuel, and it's a log scale. Yeah? And you see that for this type of, uh, of phenols, which are antioxidant, they are very, very low in pellet and ship diesel, and very high in wood combustion. We can also do with FDICR, we can look at all the CHO species, so all oxid, oxygen containing species, which are in most cases are phenols. Very high in beach, very low in pellet. Uh, so uh, this seems like take home message wood combustion aerosols are much less active compared to, sh to diesel emissions. Uh, and the pellet emissions, which are very low in concentration, su surprisingly are as active as a Lockwood combustion. And uh, here is, uh, it, it's an old theory, but I think it seems very reasonable that these antioxidant compounds, which are in wood smoke, at least for the acute effect, uh, suppress these acute effects. Of course, in the long run, you have PR ages, you know, I don't want to discuss cancer activation here, yeah? but you know, we have to dis also distinguish short-term and long-term effects, and inflammation effects, which is influenced in many diseases, could maybe mitigate it well by some of the compounds. Take home message in total is the compounds which we have in the air pollution are, well, they have different effects. They can, they can synergistic, uh, anti synergistic they can protective, you know, they can be worsened. So the mixture, to understand the mixture, is a real difficult thing because we have to understand the sources themselves and then the mixture and how the effects of those chemicals are. So it's a very good news uh, for, for me because I can, I can work for my lifetime on this topic. I don't have to change anymore. <laughs> So just uh, 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 very briefly, um, uh, 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 same for car emissions. I will speed up a little bit here now. Uh, sorry for translation in that case. Uh, same concept. We used uh, a gasoline engine with f gasoline and ethanol. Uh, and um, well, this again here you can see. Interestingly, when you have a high speed, we had a high speed cycle. This is a, this is a German autobahn cycle, 180. Yeah, so it's an Audi engine. So we had to go fast, and this is a normal cycle, European driving cycle. Uh, and when you have a high speed, your engine looks like this. It's glowing red. Yeah? When you go 180 on the, on the uh, highway, you have a glowing engine. Just, you know, remember when you drive on the German autobahn. Um, and then, okay, you know, uh, briefly only, only this graph, we concentrate now, uh, you can see uh, here is the E10, it's a normal gasoline, we always have 10% gasoline, 10% uh, ethanol. You can see here uh, the particle number and, and ECOC is much higher, for ethanol it's very much reduced. So particles are very much reduced by ethanol cars. Um, and if we now look to the regulation, um, I skipped out the gene activation pattern now, just for time, but the regulation you can see is driving cycle. This is now aerosol uh, uh, normal, um, um, 
of, of, of gasoline and high speed. We can see if we go faster, we have a bit more regulation. We, ex you know, we have a bit more emission. Uh, in the end, it turned out, if we calculate the kilometers, it might be even better to go faster. Uh, because, it, uh, because you are, in, in the normal cycle you are standing, is, the most of the time you are nearly idling. So, and if you calculate, you know, with 180 constant, you are d really doing a lot, you know, so. But of course, if you do the same distance with 80, it would be better, yeah? Constant driving. But when we look in the uh, 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 um, gasoline uh, here compared to ethanol, we see much more regulation with ethanol. Also, particles are low. And the issue here is the gas phase. So we have much more aldehydes in the gas phase. So I think the problem with gasoline cars is that you have more ethanol and, for, and, 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 and aldehydes coming out of it. I said aldehyde, very high concentration. So always when you catalyst is, is not getting it correctly, you get a peak of aldehyde. And I think in this case, this makes additional toxicity. Okay, with this, I would uh, like to close. Uh, what, is in the, what the future will bring? Well, aerosol aging is what we are doing now since one year. So we want to now to see what's the effect now of the aging. It's also exactly what, uh, what Omar did uh, in California and what he liked to implement here. Uh, and of course, ambient air. And there, I think we would like first to address China and Mexico, because you have this high concentration and the special situation here, and later on bring it to the European Union as well. Um, and, uh, of course, we have to verify this with animal experiments. Um, and just, you know, uh, uh, very briefly, we do that. Here you can see uh, it's the uh, bronchial alveolar lavage fluid, the macrophage is taken. Uh, we had four times, um, you know, three times, four hours exposure. Uh, and you could see that we can indeed differentiate that. So the, we can see that the cells are different. And if you look now at the, at the transcripts, we can see that there are more DNA damage, DNA repair is induced by these particles from a diesel engine. So this is quite nice. Um, and we, of course, now would like to transfer this from the human cell model to an animal macrophage model and then from that to a human cell model to make the bridge, because there's no way to make human experiments, I guess, at least not with us. And here you can see uh, uh, also on the bulk cells like viability or DNA damage that indeed the diesel emissions uh, are, as we have seen before, are rather harsh. So they're really inducing uh, uh, d DNA defects and the viability of the macrophages also is quite reduced. With this, I would like to summarize the second part. I've shown you that we have, we have built up now over five years all to the system, the apparat, and I think it's not yet perfect, but we are, we are working on it uh, and uh, can look at aerosol properties and biological responses on cells, of course, yeah? and animals only under special occasion. If you write w one year a, a proposal for using cell uh, and they get declined and so on. But we try to, to get this link between animals and cell activities. So interestingly is that, uh, um, uh, that we, have, uh, we have largely different uh, talks and response for different sources. So it's not, so we can even by changing of the fuel, we can change the picture totally, which means we haven't understood it too well up to now because what we predict, just PM, you know, we, we take PM to average everything, it just, the average of all maybe comes out to something, but to get the right measures to solve the problem, we need to understand what is the real reason, and this we have to, to address in the future. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, and so we have very much different effects for different uh, sources and also um, 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 different, let's say, fuels and conditions. We have done first animal exposure. We now move to, to disease models because the people which are really influenced are the uh, ill people. Yeah? If you have COPD or asthma and then air pollution, then you might have a bit problem. If you are 25 years old and in the gym, always, you, know, you will not have a big problem, of course. Yeah? So we have to look at models for the real diseases. So to summarize the first experiment, so diesel PM is indeed highly adverse and the shipping emissions are problematic, the fuel is not helping. 
pellet burner uh, without uh, uh, PM precipitation is also not a good idea. I think they are not better than a normal wood combustion. Eh? So if you would like to use wood combustion, very good, but use particle precipitation. Uh, uh, of course, we have to consider the high PI ages for Lockwood and for HFO, so we have the gene tox, it's, it's there, of course. And the car emissions, we have anyway strong gas phase contribution, therefore, if we go to biofuel, we have to be careful and test it. If there, maybe, we make a, make, maybe we make it not better with it. Yeah? Okay, this is some uh, photographs of the measurement campaigns. Here it's uh, different places, here in Rostock. Copio, again Rostock, again Copio, Finland, and uh, different teams here. And of course, these are uh, my former students who are building this type of instruments for online PIH particle measurements, online gas phase PIHs, and so on. Um, and we have many projects with them. Small enterprise funding and university is quite quite efficient uh, way to get to get funding. And of course, here's a group, and this is nearly as high as here. It's in uh, um, it's, it's a Zugspitze, highest mountain in Germany. We have a research station, and there we are. We are we, we can because uh, Helmholtz is one of the operator. We can go there. They have conference facilities, and it's now it's 2,700 meters. So here, 2,200 meters. So, uh, but you know, when I la landed here, I had the same feeling when I came the first day up here, and I run up the stairs. Uh, <laughs> what, what's happening here? But you know, uh, it's but in here the air is very much clean, and they're also in this research station on the other side. They are doing many of measurements for clean air, clean air in Europe. Yeah? So to look at the uh, control, and now I'm not too much over time, I think, and I thank you for the audience. Well, very nice talk. Thank you very much. So, um, ahora hay tiempo para preguntas. Pueden hacerlas en español. You can use this ah. uh, product for a translator. And, uh, or you can, use, uh, you can uh, do it in English. Por favor. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, uh. Yeah, thank you very much for your talk. Um, quick question. The ethanol that you tested was what type of ethanol? From which uh, um, it was a sugar ethanol or what kind of uh, ethanol? No, it was, uh, well, actually, I don't know. It was just, you know, it was like a fuel, uh, you know, E85 is a fuel with 15% of gasoline and ethanol. I think it's an industrial ethanol from, from, from the fuel supplier. So it okay. was fuel. But yeah. Okay. But it, you don't know if it was from sugar, ethanol, no. or no. Okay. no. Because there could be differences and could be interesting because no. in Mexico, if we ever use ethanol, will be because we uh, br bring it from the United States from uh, uh, corn, yes. ethanol, or sugar, ethanol. And I would like to see the so differences. So from Brazil, it's different, sugar. of course. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Okay. So I think probably it's not, not from sugar in, 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 in Germany. Germany. Yeah. So okay. it's, a, it's from a European uh, f fuel manufacturer. Yeah. Okay, all right. Okay, that's all. Muy bien. Rodolfo. Thanks, very nice talk, congratulations. I have a question with regards to the consumption of fuels in chips. Uh, has a general recommendations, uh, heavy fuel oil is recommended when the ship is traveling on, on the ocean. And what happens when the ship arrives to the port? It's yes. recommended to use a, a cleaner fuel. Uh, in theory, it sounds good, which technically could be hard. I please let me know which is the, the experience in Europe and your opinion, yes, please. I can I can tell you. So there is the International Maritime Organization, and they have already um, well they try to negotiate how to clean it up. And you can imagine if the whole world is sitting on a table, how difficult it is. But what they have, they have so-called Sika zones, sulfur emission zones. So in this in these regions, uh, you you have a limit of sulfur concentration in the fuel. 
And the idea is, of course, heavy fuel oil is always high in sulfur. If you have refined fuel, you are low in sulfur. And uh, so uh, that is what they're doing now. So if you come to Europe in the Channel or Baltic Sea, you are not allowed to use heavy fuel oil anymore. So the ships have two, um, have two uh, tanks and they can switch. Uh, or they have only heavy fuel oil, then they need a scrubber. And the scrubber is scrubbing out the sulfur. But you know, for, for and, and this is a problem, because if you scrub the sulfur, you don't uh, scrub the particles. So you emit the particles anyway, but the sulfur is washed with, uh, with, with seawater and stored. Uh, so th that is more or less a problem. But uh, in the moment, the people uh, in, in, in Europe, they target, or, or internationally, they target in several um, pristine areas that, uh, uh, and, and uh, also pop uh, populated areas, they target it by reducing sulfur. And our, uh, so we fight, uh, uh, also we have hearings with the commission and so we fight to stop this, to say no, we would like to have a particle emission limit because the sulfur itself, SO2 is not a big issue for health. So the issue is the particles and they are not controlled. Thank you. So you, um, I mean, you've got all the nasty stuff in the heavy fuel oil, the metals and the pHs, but you're seeing more activity from the, yes. the diesel. So acute activity, yeah. Uh, but, I mean, could that be the the phase of the particles? You know, the fact that it's a more solid-like elemental carbon versus versus the heavy fuel oil, or, or can you speculate on on what the difference? Well, is? Um, um, you know, I think now. For, uh, we have to be careful to differentiate between the different sources. But if we compare now specifically the two uh, fuels in, in diesel emission, uh, it seems like, or it's also known from experiment, that this hard suit, so the suit itself, it's quite uh, a, a problem. Yeah? So these particles are disintegrated and taken up. We have even seen the suit particles in the cells. So they are actively taken up. Uh, and so also the amount of compounds uh, might be might be lower. They are potentially carried in more efficiently. Uh, but it's not you know it's not the suit alone. But the suit we have more suit by just measured by black carbon in the wood combustion emissions. So there is even more suit in there. Uh, uh, but we have ve uh, the lowest effect at all. And there we have, on the one hand, we have the antioxidant activity of the phenols. On the other hand, uh, of course, the suit structure is very dif uh, different if you have an explosion engine or if you have more or less a smoldering type of formation of suit like in wood combustion. So we measure suit as black carbon yeah, or uh, either optically yeah, or elemental carbon. But of course, the chemical structure of the suit is very diff uh, different. And um, when I have shown that the particles are taken up in the cells, this, this mechanism with the rupture of the lysosomes plays a role. And suddenly this, let's say, differently formed carbonaceous species or particles ending up directly in the cell. And I think it's much too, le too little understand how the structure of the suit itself is. But I think that this freshly formed suit from an engine, you know, up explosion engine reactive site still not you know uh, um, um, uh, reacted so this might be might be the reason for it yeah nice talk Ralph thanks for for the talk uh, I'm curious about you have compared the short with long term uh, response in, in exposure from the cells yeah no we haven't uh, and that's exactly that what we would like to do. So um, in the moment, you know, it's, it's, it's a short-term response experiment. Uh, and we look only via the chemicals we have and the information from that. We can, of course, understand some of the long-term effects, you know, because the gene activation, DNA damage, uh, this is very well established. Um, for long-term exposure, you need to have cells stable for exposure longer. And uh, this system, we work together with Vitrocell. It's our third system we developed with them. And we are now able about 24 hours exposures, but it's still not stable. So we would like, what we would like to do, we would like to have 40 hours stability. And then uh, we are hopefully in the shape 
also to go to ambient concentrations. Ambient concentration in Mexico and China, not in Germany, but maybe even later then. Yeah? But uh, we discussed also this before with the biological uh, people here in, in, uh, in Mexico. Uh, of course, when you do long-term exposure, you have other problems like biological activities, bacterial growth and everything like that. In the moment, you just would like to make the system in a way that even with clean air exposure, the uh, effects on the cell is minimal. Yeah, because uh, the exposure is also making effects. And you would like to have it really, uh, really low effect, like in an incubator. And if we have that maintained, I think we are ready to take, to make experiments here in Mexico with the system. <laughs> Um, here. I'd like to ask um, your opinion on the air pollution mitigation strategy in Europe or in Germany in the European Union as a whole um, in terms of the push towards uh, diesel engine cars and the renewables using wood pellets. Um, in the context of um, the health impacts of the emissions from those uh, sources and what we have learned um, so far and what uh. are they considering? Yeah, nice question. And diesel is actually, you know, um, it's something really um, very bad happened. I think what the industry has done there, I think you are all aware of that scandal. Uh, so, um, you know, companies which are really earning billions and have money for everything, you know, trying to, to save uh, 300 euros for a bigger tank of AdBlue, for me, this is unbelievable. It's, it's just unbelievable. And it shows, on the other hand, it shows that it's not the way, like, you know, very often politics like to do, like, an industry public pact and the industry itself, you know, do something good for the environment, you know, and this has shown if, you know, normally I'm, I'm quite proud of German companies. I think many are doing quite well. But if you see that, you know, if even those companies are cheating in that way, you can say without pressure and forcing from outside, nothing will happen. It's really, uh, you know, diesel, you know, I think with a diesel particulate filter, uh, most likely many of the particle uh, 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 things have been solved, but the NOx is technically easily solvable, and uh, they have uh, not done it because of pure money reasons. Yeah? So it's really embarrassing. So I think that you can make a clean diesel, yeah? but of course you have to pay for it, and either the customer has to pay or the company has to reduce uh, has to reduce their revenue or you cheat. And German companies uh, decided to cheat. Yeah? So that's it. So in principle, you, you can make, uh, and I like the diesel for that way, that the total efficiency, if you push the refining process to diesel fraction, use diesel and make a good cleaning up afterwards, I think you would have less climate activity because you are more energy efficient with that engine. And the engines last longer, this car cycle could be longer, so you could have less production of cars. Well, they don't like it, they want to make you to buy a new car every three years. But, you know, uh, I think the diesel is not bad by itself, but you really have to invest something to do, to do it. And this was done terribly wrong. On the other hand, now people are, are pushing on, on the e-car. Yeah? Uh, and I think uh, this is a very good solution maybe for, like here, Mexico, you say, no? well, if you do here e-cars, you have no emissions. Of course, you have to make the power somewhere. Yeah? And if you, if, you have, if you then make dirty coal power plants, it's not working. But if you have solar energy and wind energy, it could be, it could be for sure a good option, you know, the best option, I think. But in, in general, I think th this scandal with diesel has really shown uh, what we have to do. We have to really, you know, to, to look at the effects and for, for the biomass, for example. It's very good, but you have to make filters. Yeah? So not, no emissions without filters. That's, I think, the message. Hello. In your opinion, is 
uh, possible to study the site distribution and chemical composition at the same time uh, to understand better the health effects? So I'm not 100% sure if I get it. So which so of course when we do this when we do these measurements we always look at size distribution, we look at the chemistry, uh, and also with for example the uh, time of light mass spectrometer I've shown briefly, there you measure the size of the particle and the chemistry. But uh, this is I think in the so our dream or our dream for in 10 years is that we have a set of parameters we measure maybe uh, some chemicals maybe some cell-based or cell type of assay, maybe some physical uh, properties like size, number, and so on, to have really uh, an array of data which describes uh, the health effect best. But on the other hand, from the results, you could see we are far away from that because we are still not understanding so good. Actually, for us, each experiment is a surprise somehow. Ok, ok, terminamos la sesión. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, and very nice.